Fellow auto detailers, welcome to the show that features interviews with today's most successful auto detailers. This is the Auto Detailing Podcast. Here's your host, Jimbo Balaam. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to this episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. This is a super special episode, and I was actually planning on holding this one until episode 400, but I just am too impatient, and so I'm not going to do that. So this episode is brought to you by House Call Pro. Uh, It's a CRM for detailers that perfectly integrates with the Detailer Inner Circle and the things that we offer in there. So if you're not a part of the Detailer Inner Circle, I definitely highly suggest you check that out at DetailerInnerCircle.com. And then after you do that, check out HouseCallPro.com slash ADP. That's where you're going to get a free demo to see services totally like. Um, and then you're going to get your first month for only 19 bucks, which is less than half the price if you decide to sign up. Anyway, so this week's episode... I had the ultimate privilege, uh, once in a lifetime privilege, to fly up to Tacoma, Washington uh, and check out, not only check out, the incredibly detail-oriented, incredible facility, headquarters, flagship store of the brand Griot's Garage, um, but Nick, Nick Griot, uh, was nice enough to uh, not only give me the tour, facilitate the tour for me, kind of give me the history on Griot's, um, <clears throat> but also we got to sit in his office and conduct this interview of what you're going to hear now. I want to give a special thanks to Nick himself and also Richard Griot. Uh, we had about, I, I was there for about a total of three hours, actually three and a half hours. Um, and, and during the course of that, I met uh, one of the other Griot's boys. I don't remember his name, so I apologize for that. Um, but had a really candid, open, raw, honest conversation uh, with Nick and then also Richard at the same time um, right there in the kind of back, back room where they have a lot of their cars. Um, and so I'm just really, really grateful uh, for the opportunity and for the hospitality, I would highly recommend if you guys are ever in the Seattle, Tacoma, Washington area, uh, or it would it would honestly be worth a standalone trip to to go out there. I uh, can't guarantee that you're going to see Nick and Richard, uh, but that was uh, definitely a special treat for me. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. And again, thank you to Nick and Richard and the Griot family for uh, the hospitality that they showed me. Hope you guys really enjoy this one. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Welcome to the Auto Detailing Podcast. We're in Tacoma, Washington at Griot's Garage World Headquarters. Yes, sir. Right? In yep. flagship store. Yep. We're sitting down with Nick Grio. Are you the middle son? Middle? I, I'm the There's first son. The first son. son. Yeah. Okay. Of, Perfect. Of, of the four kids. So the first son of Richard Grio, who started Grio's Garage. Mm-hmm. So thanks for uh, taking the time to come on the podcast. Yeah, man. It's my pleasure. This is awesome. I just got the full grand tour. Got to hang out with your dad or Richard, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we, we discussed that dynamic, but yeah, it was, it was awesome for you to be able to meet him and, and see his space and what he does. And um, again, he's still in the building. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And, and we joked around a little bit about him becoming senile or not or yeah. whatever, right? Or does he need glasses? Does he not? And yeah, I, well, the, the whole discussion of his eyes, um, you know, <laughs> we, we get these financial reviews and, uh, you know, it's a little bit smaller print and I'll kind of walk into his office and say, hey, are you up on this? And he's got a magnifying glass out. So he may not need glasses. He needs glasses. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's in denial. But he can still, again, I, uh, he's right on about like assessing a paint surface or anything like yep. that nothing passes him got it he, he will tear the car apart and for those that haven't well for those that haven't had the opportunity to come up here this is a full-blown operation restoration shop you guys are expanding at, to a whole nother building but take us back to the very beginning that's where i always like to start like what what is and i'm glad we're having you on and like what is your first memory of griot's garage or this this company that um you know your dad your parents had going on yeah all right well um <clears throat> i guess it started so before I start from the <laughs> genesis I, of the- I i was just thinking i guess it starts because it's always been griot's garage even before it was griot's garage yes in air quotes yes. right yeah and 
Uh, I mean, really, it, it starts with my dad. Um, I mean, you, you heard him talk. Yeah. He's died in the wool car guy. He was um, working on, you know, Jeeps in uh, yeah. my, my his sister and his Jeep in their garage in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, and that transitioned to uh, working at a restoration and high end uh, sports car shop in Boulder, Colorado, where he went to school. Um, where they then, didn't want to hire him. Yeah, they didn't want to hire him. He, he tells the story, he worked for free. And actually, I did hear a wage, and it was like 15, 20 cents an hour. It was wow. not good. But he wow. was the errand boy mm-hmm. at the shop, and that's how he got in the door. Um, and as he tells it, that's how he kind of learned how to understand and appreciate tools. And then that segued into him being a uh, race mechanic at Jim Russell. Mm. Um, fast forward, met my mom, helped her run her company until she wanted to be my mom and help. <laughs> raised my siblings and I and uh, he had a kind of uh, come to Jesus moment with his dad and his dad uh, you know encouraged him to start a company uh, based upon his passion for cars and um, as I understand it from him he started by prospecting at uh, Pebble Beach and the Monterey event that we now go to every year um, saying hey if I had a catalog of all these tools um, would you you know, would you buy them? And he didn't have a catalog at the time. He just created it um, <laughs> after that, you know, interest started. So, um, and at the time it was very garage oriented. Okay. Um, he was providing solutions based upon what he thought was the best way to organize your garage, the best tools, the best available chemicals at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like he said to you, he had a window cleaner formula that yeah. then started a bunch of different formulas. And, here we are nearly 30 years later and we have all the manufacturing in-house and almost a hundred, uh, you know, unique and wholly owned chemical formulations mm-hmm. in our brand. Did it start? Cause I remember the glass cleaning story. Did it start with chemicals then, or did it start with tools? So it was, it was a both. Oh, was, both. At yeah, the same time. So part of and it, it literally was like, I'm looking at that catalog over your right shoulder. Like it started literally with a catalog. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, okay. and, um, that was my grandpa's advice to him was that that was uh, how to not be geographically dependent. Got you had it. access to uh, the entire U.S. market. And this is, again, 1990 before yeah. the Internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we live in a totally different right. world, but we still send out a catalog. So uh, has it almost become like and we're going to jump all over the place. Yeah. And that's just how I roll. So yeah, no worries. bear with me. Sorry. Sorry in advance. Right. But is it become kind of like it started out with the way that you do things right through a catalog but has it like through the years come full circle where people because of the internet and because everything is at their fingertips they actually like can't wait to get the physical catalog yeah like has it come full circle where people want it yes and honestly like you go uh and you spend any time like managing our social media accounts it's amazing how many people discover us through that then find out we're a catalog, then request mm. it. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I did not realize the breadth and depth of your offering. Right. And again, it's a 70 page catalog. It's got over, you know, almost a thousand products in there. Wow. So, um, it, you know, it's not just the chemicals. It's everything, you know, you touch your car mm-hmm. with. It's the orbitals, the pads, the towels. Yep. Still have a lot of organizational stuff in there. But um, that's kind of ebbed and flowed over the years. And again, the the world has changed right, over right, the right. course of this company. Again, a lot of the hand tools I was showing you have just yep. kind of become commodities. Whereas, right. you know, when we were offering them back in the day, we were the only person mm-hmm. you could buy these European brands from. Now they're on Amazon. Right. So, <laughs> like, what do you Isn't know? That crazy. And the the focus has always been, and I told you this kind of when we first were talking, is like the focus has always been on like ultra high quality stuff, right? Whether it's the tools that you're talking about or the, the chemicals, or even down to like the building and the brand, like everything looks very proper, very high end, you know, very, uh, for lack of a better word, different, but in a good way, right? And when we were talking about retailers, I thought about your bottles and you were talking about shelf space and real estate. And I thought, you know, what's interesting is when you go to an auto zone or a O'Reilly's or auto parts store, right? And you go down the automotive section, I love doing that, right? Every time you go there, you always see someone like totally lost, right? Because everything looks the exact same. But when you see the Griots bottles, they're different. 
right? And so it's like everything, and even talking with your dad, everything seems like it's been so thought out. And so, but quality has always been at the forefront of all those thoughts. Yeah, and I think that uh, as my dad explains it, he he started selling to his father's generation, and now mm. we're selling to his generation, and we're uh, we're thinking about one purchase, but a customer for life. Mm. And so, with every product, we we want you to buy it from us knowing that it's the last time you should have to buy that. Mm -hmm. And so that is in our, you know, lifetime guarantee. Um, and, and also again, the, the, the last thing is the familial, uh, and very easily identifiable mm -hmm. brand. Um, so, you know, you look at our product line and when you walk through the store, you'll see all these colors lined up. None of them are the same, right? Each, each product has a different color yep. and we try and like keep it a very easy visual identifier. So you're not grabbing two of the same and granted with some right. of the interior products that are uh dye or perfume free um they're they're clear but, sure um yeah it, that is that's my dad's attention to detail for sure and that's his personality is very similar to mm. most of the type a's the highly right. organized detailed yep. uh oriented people and uh, he's just he's just managed that for so long for so mm -hmm. uh and and again it kind of makes my job easy right right now because uh, I know what my boundaries are, but right. also it makes it really maddening because we'll, you when know, when you're trying to get the right red. Yeah. The reds are, that's the one <laughs> thing we discuss. Then it, you, you go through the building, uh, things are painted, things are powder coated, but they all, I mean, we're sitting in red chairs, right, so right, right. like everything is correct. And, uh, yeah, it, like he said, when we were re renovating this thing, it was an eight month project. Mm -hmm. It was balls to the wall. He's here every day. Yep. Um, and when he wasn't here, you're he was saying, well, you have one of three colors to choose from and you shouldn't <laughs> put something white next to something white. There's got to be contrast. Got so it. You, you know, you have a palette of three, white, black, or red. And, uh, and I will be there to check you at the end of it. So, uh, don't mess up. <laughs> so, so I'm glad you brought up the building. And so let's talk about the, the building, uh, talk about where you guys were before, as far as like the setup and then how this building kind of came to be. Yeah. Um, so, uh, company started in 1990 we're in a very small warehouse down in vista california yeah. which is right outside of san diego um we moved up here in 1994 and at that point in time we had begun manufacturing our own products mm. and it was a little harder to do that in california as we discussed yep. um yep. and this is where my grandparents had retired they had moved up here and we had been coming up in the summers and my mom and dad fell in love with the area and uh, Griot's Garage was able to be housed in this industrial park that had just been built. And so we were there for uh, 15 years. And at some point during there, in fact, in 2004, we stopped manufacturing in that space and built a facility in Indianapolis. And we were just a headquarters and uh, right. you know, our creative department, our photo shoot area in a warehouse. And it was kind of you know, not, it wasn't what he had imagined. Right. We had a, like I told you, we had a 250 square foot retail lobby that was our store. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had probably a tiny little portion of the parking lot that wasn't filled with semi trucks that we could have car shows. And that had become a huge part of our business was partnering with mm. car clubs and hosting events. And um, so 2008 comes along uh we're in a in a growing position our our facility in indy is doing well and we have the opportunity to buy a facility in foreclosure and that facility is the one we're sitting in right now which i told you in the 50s was a quarantine <laughs> hospital for gis that were coming back from world war ii with some unsavory illnesses <laughs> um and then Coca-Cola bought it and was using it as a bottling and manufacturing plant mm. up until 2007. And so we bought it. It was really dilapidated um, and said, you know, when we went, we went. It was an eight-month project, mm. um, did all the seismic upgrades, left as much of the original character of the building intact, granted, without asbestos, without lead paint. Sure. Um, we poured some slabs and really laid it out to be a cultural center as much as it is our headquarters. Love that. So do you guys have pictures of the whole process? Yeah, we do. We Got have uh, up on our blog, um, 
which is in my garage.com. We have a, what a great URL. Yeah, I know. Wow. I didn't know you guys had that. Yeah. I mean, and you know, the blog space when we were starting our blog was active and now it's like everybody's video blog. Right. 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 Or, you know, just that, that place has grown so much, Mm -hmm. um, that we still, we still service it. It has a lot of our media and imagery from our events and stuff, but we documented that entire process and it was extensive. Um, but yeah, we've been here 10 years now and it's, uh, we have, uh, four and a half acres, about 250, uh, I don't know. That number keeps floating around. I think I've said three different numbers. Oh, here, you know? the, the it's a, of lot, cars. a lot of parking stalls to host <laughs> an event. Um, and year round we're doing events. And, uh, again, it's a, we average about 125 to 150 events per year That's in, in this facility. Same. That's in this facility. Yeah. Not like, cause when you said that number initially, when we were talking, I'm like, oh, okay, like. 125 events around the country like that's a lot of events like you know because i figure two a week or whatever maybe more than that but then you're like no here yeah. and i'm like oh crap yeah. that's a lot i know and, it, and like i said or i showed you we have the it really does help the business sure. in a lot of ways obviously we have the sales portal of the sure. store yeah um but we have the training facility in our car care school where we're able to educate people mm-hmm um how to use our products and then um those spaces that are community driven that um we that are open to the public that can be used and reserved free of charge so long as they're in business hours um that that have really helped solidify this this uh this building's kind of space in the car culture at least in our area seems like the ultimate because you do you have the free like double bays and it's not like a little janky like double bay spot it's like a huge space yeah. <laughs> that people can you know it's not like oh it's free but you know it's like eh, it's kind of your car may not fit if you have a certain car it's like no no matter what kind of car you got it's going to fit in the bay and you guys could troubleshoot or detail your car or whatever yeah and and like i told you i've, I've not I, it's generally pleasant experiences but it's mostly people that are just like uh they're kind of like why you started this podcast right. right they're just like where do i find this information right right right, right. and they're at a dealership down the street and yep. they're like yeah you want to put it in back right you guys will do 25 dollars worth of work <laughs> right and you'll be worse off or you can go up the street to this place and they'll yep. they'll teach you all you need to know but it's and it's awesome how you guys have been able to i mean I, we could use the red as a as an example of just like the the how it's weaved through the whole system or the whole culture the whole brand and then i feel like this building solidified that even more of like not only do you have the detail bay though but you have the full restoration shop right and your dad's in the restoration shop right and probably still tinkers today he looked like i think he just got back from a trip but he's probably on his back some days tinkering around yeah i mean i i would say that uh he's not doing welding or metal work but um he's definitely i mean i he still cleans his own cars. Uh, granted, we cycle through some cars sure. and we're, we're sorting stuff out. And sure. Sometimes, but his daily drivers like, seem clean. Yeah. Oh yeah. It didn't. And in Washington, it and, yeah, Washington. and it's been raining. Yeah. At, like yeah. I looked at it like this is your daily. Like it's pretty clean. Yeah. It, it was really clean, not pretty clean. It was really clean. Got to be legit. Got you know. Got to practice what through we preach. Through and through, man. It seems yeah. like that's the that is the overarching theme. Is like you guys are solid through and through with everything yeah and and again i just think this is what we love this is it's not hard for us to and get even excited down to, to your do your your slogan right isn't it have fun in your garage have fun in your garage yeah <clears throat> and we're spending more time in the garage in the winter around here than yep. you are right in California. definitely definitely and that's like that's the worst thing but it's also it kind of is like the the character of our town it's just right. this like hardened right uh, you mentioned that blue, yeah <laughs> like blue collar yeah. town yeah um that yeah, they're going to show up when it's 10 degrees out because it's not <laughs> raining uh, on at 8 a.m. on a Saturday in February because yeah. we're starting up Formula One cars. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it uh, again, it, this is all just a it's a big passion project that's just yep. kind of gotten wheels and there's rolled and rolled yeah. and rolled and is going wild. Love that. So where do you obviously Richard's your dad, but when did you kind of enter the fold of coming on full time? Because you're actually a detailer yourself. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, one of my claim to fame is like the earliest memory. You, you said this. <laughs> OK. One of my claims to fame. We have we have uh, about five employees that have been with us for over 20 years in this building. Wow. And that is a tribute to my dad and the environment he's created here for sure. But um, I'm the only one in this building 
with all those other employees who was ever in our Vista facility. So that's Got like it. my claim okay. to Got it. So I, I, was, I used to play around with all the packing materials when I was a little kid. Um, so you, you're, you, no one could take the trophy for like longest employee. Well, 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 well. I, and, and I've had my fits and stuff. Or you weren't so. an employee then because you were probably underage, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, technically. Yeah. Child labor laws. Yeah, weren't, uh, weren't an employee. Uh, I was having fun. <laughs> but no, I, I was working in our warehouse when, uh, when I was a teenager. Um, like right when I got into high school, that was kind of the impetus okay. of you got to get to work. Mm. And my dad had always been very uh, emphatic about you're not going to sit around. You're going right. to start working. Um, and I worked in the warehouse, uh, making a minimum, minimum wage for a couple summers and bought an old car. But at the same time, I was doing some training and learning all of our uh, products and realized that I had more value being a detailer, mm-hmm. that I could go charge, you know, 25 bucks yeah. to wash a car for just a basic wash. Yep. Um, I told you I was, like that, that started with a flyer and my best friend who worked in the warehouse with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, we started partnering with these golf clubs locally. Where Which we, is a great idea. Oh my gosh, golfers are so <coughs> dirty. And yep. like, they would just, you know, four hours, yep. we yeah. could do uh, like a one-step, yep. a quick all-in-one process yep. and make 250 bucks by, yep. the guy, by the time that guy got back and was done yep. playing golf. Yep. Um, and people that golf usually have money. Yeah. Right? Because they're usually a, a member to the club. And so there's – it's not a cheap hobby no, to be a golfer. No, I remember uh, my best customer, uh, Mr. Mitchell, drove a, a green XKE. Mm-hmm. I washed his car every week. He said, don't even use soap. I'm like, we're going to use soap, bud. <laughs> we're going to wash the hell out of your car. You literally come back and give us money every week. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I did that through college. Uh, I think we kind of yeah, talked yeah. about that as yep. well. That was, you know, beer money. And, yeah. Heck yeah. Um, and, you know, when I, I joined a fraternity and I uh, detail guys' cars before their parents came into town. Yep. And they were. <laughs> That's all, a great niche. Oh, they were so stoked oh because gosh. their parents would come in and be like, oh, my gosh, you took such right. good care of your car. Yeah. Like, hey, thanks, Grio, man. You saved my ass. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was trying, you know, this guy had like a black infinity G 35 and, and he had like sold his dad on, on wanting to, you know, nut for this car. Yeah. Right. Right. And it was thrashed. And I just did like a quick, uh, I like a one step sealant, which was, you know, back, back in the day is way more aggressive and, uh, it just cut right through everything. And he had this beautiful <laughs> black car and I saved the day. He's from Kentucky, so he gave me some good bourbon um, <laughs> as a result of that one. But <laughs> well worth stoked. it. Yeah, and then um, got out of school, did uh, commercial real estate, which I loved. Okay. And I was, I was, part of that was I was working on this building in 09 when I graduated. It's about the same time. Yeah, like, yeah. No job market. Yep. Just helping my dad out, and I met my first boss. He, he came in, called on us, and just said, hey, I'm here. I'm a local broker. And my dad was like, hey, do you want a, a free, you know, runner to go, right. and, like, put him to work? <laughs> and I worked there for five years, and I uh, love that industry, uh, but it's super cutthroat. Mm. I think I was listening to your uh, podcast with Adam Patali, and he said that he worked in that. So that's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a um, lot of parallels. Yeah, and that, again, I, I really liked it because I was learning about the town I grew up in yep. and actually transacting and helping with all these other businesses. But mm. at the end of the day – uh, I liked helping this business right. the most. I knew right. the most about it. Um, I was always on my back in the mm-hmm. parking garage telling this guy like what was wrong with his car. So I couldn't really escape that Got it. fate. Yep. And uh, isn't that such an interesting thing? Like it's something about cars, like in detailing specifically, I guess for me. But like you can never escape it. And as far as you, like, I've tried to quit detailing like so many times, <laughs> and every time I try to quit. I only get like entrenched more like even starting this podcast. Like it kind of came out of time where I wanted to start a podcast, but it was like detail. A detailing podcast was the furthest thing from my mind. I wanted to start a podcast to get out of detailing. And then I end up starting a podcast about detailing, which is, but it's fun, right? Yeah. Again, I, I just, this was like even mechanical stuff. I, I remember, uh, just like being on the back under this land cruiser, like in a suit that I bought. Like, man, I don't want to be <laughs> right. like on the ground here. Right, and right, right. Of course I will. Like I love this, but man, I gotta you know go back in the office right, after this. Right. <laughs> so, 2014, I I came into my dad's office and said, "Look, I need to work for you again." Mm. And uh, 
said okay. And so what was it? And if if it's personal, you don't have to answer. But what was it about? Why did you want to come work for him? Well, were you just tired of the cutthroatness of the no, real estate well, industry? Again, I, the the last job I worked on at uh, CBRE, which was mm-hmm. the um, business I was at. Again, I I have nothing bad to say about that, but. It was at the time when we were looking about or looking for more opportunities to build more stores around the country. Mm. And I was also leasing uh, a portion of our warehouse space that we weren't utilizing at the time um, back in Indianapolis. Mm. So I'll, I was working on two Griot's Garage projects. Got it. And when you're in commercial real estate, you have to go and learn somebody's business mm-hmm. and then go act on their behalf. And they trust you to do what's best for them. And I didn't have that, you know, kind of hesitation when I was working mm-hmm. on behalf of Griot's Garage because I knew exactly right, what right. they needed. Like, hey, you need two bays. We need this many parking right. stalls. Like, there's just there's no questions asked. And that's when it really was like, I love this business. Um. I this is what I want to do. I want to help instead of learning five businesses right. and how I can help each one of them, each one with its own level of risk that I'm doing something wrong for right. that company. Right. That I can could put, gets exhausting. Too. Yeah, yeah, and right. and um, I can put all my energy into this one, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know I came from this like desk job where I'm wearing a suit and tie mm-hmm. every day, and come into my dad's office and say, "Hey, I'm going to work for you," and it was like a really emotional moment for mm-hmm. both of us because he he had pushed us away, saying like, "I don't want you to to come here unless it's what you love," mm. and so for him to realize that that I did love his business was a big moment for him. But mm. he said, "Well, we need a events, uh, you know, national events presence. So can you drive a truck?" I'm like, "Well, I can learn." Right. And so literally, I, I, that was in February. It, by June, we had a a trailer set up wow. that we were driving on our way to Loveland, Colorado, to a good guy show for oh. our first out of state car show. And you um, were driving the truck. I was driving the truck. Whoa! And with with my buddy Jason, who uh, is you know one of our longest tenured employees, okay. twenty three years. Whoa! So uh, we were just doing it. Yep. And uh, we went the whole year, and realized like, oh my gosh, we have all these formalities that we've got to do. So right. we went and got our Class A CDL. So I was learning how to drive fifty three footers with thirteen speeds, and I learned how to drive truck. Wow. And trailer, actually. That's like one thing they teach you. Like, Got you're not it. driving truck, you're driving trailer. Um, <laughs> so I was a class A truck driver okay. for three years, uh, spreading the word of right. Grace Garage across the wow. country. And it was absolutely like the hardest job I'd ever had. I was going to say, it's, I, I know you wouldn't use the word miserable, but oh, it I sounds was miserable. It's I was miserable, miserable. For, for some moments, for sure. Yeah. Because I mean, that's a grind. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, again, from this like, this very clean, like mm. you clock in at this time, you got clock it. out at this time too. Like you got to get to this place yep. and it's hot and sweaty. Yep. And my brother keeps calling me. <laughs> That's like one of the <laughs> things about working with your family. Like <laughs> He's like, what's for lunch? Yeah, you've always got time for me, right, man? <laughs> like, um, so yeah, that, uh, that, and that was a great way to meet our customers sure. yeah, in the yeah. country. And yeah. really, now it's become a huge part of our business. Got it. Outside of what we do here, mm-hmm. uh, we recently bought like a huge truck and trailer. Mm-hmm. And we had to hire a professional truck driver because the business just grew. <laughs> and, and with all the compliance, you know, when we were doing it, we would we'd get to a show two days before it started, take our break. And then work the weekend, take our break. Right. You know, you had, you're very strictly regulated right. with regards to... Mm. how long you can work and right but we were just paying for hotels while we were sitting you know like in arkansas somewhere. right right um Ugh. and while my wife is back right in washington being like hey come on right how you, long are you gonna be yeah, there do you love me <laughs> like um, right so it was and, like dad can we hire someone for this yeah well, on the it, and it just grew it grew <laughs> right. to the point where yeah like, yeah we couldn't be wasting that time. And you don't want to be, I mean, that's a, it's interesting. I, I interviewed cause I saw him at a show, the Mag- one of the McGuire's truck drivers. Oh, I love those so, guys. Probably Spike or, uh, uh, gosh, what was his name? I, I know all of them. Yes. I, I he honestly he like owns them. a pizza shop okay. in Oklahoma too. All right. right. And I forget, he does the, 
he does mainly like the West Coast stuff. I forget his name off the top of my head. But anyway, it talking with him, I had him on the podcast because I thought it'd be the coolest story on the face of the earth, right? Like, well, second coolest. This story is pretty cool. <laughs> Sorry. But um, but it's a grind. You get there. You have to set up. Then you work the show. Then you got to tear down. And then you got to go to the next place. And yeah. I think I met him in L.A. And he had to be in Chicago in like three days. And he's like, well, then we got to wash the rig before we get there. So we actually have to get there in like two and a half days because we got to wash it before. It's like, yeah, dude, that's no, I mean, brutal. We're in appearance chemicals. You can't show up to a car show and, right. try and sell you wax with a bad looking rig. It, it's brutal. Yeah, that's a brutal gig. No, it is. And uh, again, it's kind of it's kind of funny that you mentioned those guys, because that's how, again, you get to see the country, right. you get to meet your customer. But it is a circuit, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you'll go to shows and be like, hey, there's our there's our competitive set like yeah. right there, yeah. right, right across the yeah. aisle. And you can't dislike that right. guy because he's doing the same job as you. And so you go yep. up and you get to know him. Yep. And, um, you know, the car culture, there's not that like abrasion in general. There's um, really not. But I always say it's like because people always say, yeah, but what about all the crap on Facebook that you see? And I always tell people it's like. You can almost tell who's not really entrenched in the industry because they act abrasive. Yeah. Right. The guys that are like the internal people that run the circuit that like see each other a lot. You see, they're all cool with each other. Yeah. Like there's really no I've never come up to I've never come against much resistance or or heard any beef between people. When I was with Adam Patali, he had nothing but great things to say about your dad. Yeah. You know, and, and like the internal people that. I like to say, and maybe it's an oversimplification, but like the people that really run the industry, you know, are, are all extremely cool with each other. At least they put on that face, but yeah. it seems genuine. Well, no. And, and again, if you run into them enough, uh, you're going to find out. Yeah. And honestly, I, ha I found a lot less that are that way. Yeah. Um, they're, they're the exception. Right. And um, the, the biggest thing that I always try and keep in mind is, again, we, we sell something that people want, mm -hmm. not that they right. need. Right. right. Yep. Professional detailers, obviously, you need some stuff to uh, to, you know, sure. complete your job. But when I'm selling to somebody that's, you know, owns his 70 Firebird and loves it and mm -hmm. has had it since he was 15, he doesn't really need any car wax. or Right. Watch. Granted, it will help him maintain his sure. car and keep it nice and, and he can be proud of it. Mm -hmm. But we're not selling medicine, right? Right, right, right. He's not going to die if he doesn't yeah, buy your wax. Yeah, at the end <laughs> of the day, this is a discretionary sure. know, uh, industry that yep. we're in, and so if you can't keep that in mind, and if you're too hoity-toity for that, man, yep. you're not going to last. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and again, that that just permeates throughout the the car culture. Yeah, yep. um, I think the only guys that are exceptions to that are like race car drivers that are mm. like. They're just so driven and they're right. winners and they like, yeah. they hate Their each other. Egos came out a little bit maybe. Yeah. 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 So from where has your position here then kind of evolved into from driving the truck to what are you bring us to present day? What are you doing? Yeah. So I still make a point to go to events, uh, but it's about five to six and that includes SEMA, which is a big week long yep. slog. Um, but I, that I work true. Yeah. I mean, so I feel so bad for everyone working a booth oh, at man, SEMA. You know, I, uh, I don't like SEMA. I, I don't no know, one. I don't, I don't think anyone who, does that works a booth. I, I love the show. It's sure. very important. Yep. But I don't like working it because we stay in our booth yep. the whole time. I don't get to 100%. see the cars. I see photos just like yep. everybody else. And like, yep. I'm there for a week Yep. and I don't see a single, yep. I mean, outside the cars that are like in my path yep. my booth <laughs> right. <and> back, <laughs> or in between the bathroom yep. and my booth. Like that's about it. Right. So, uh, you know, that like that seeing all those cars that people just put so much work mm -hmm. into, that's kind of lost. But right. um, my day to day is uh, in product development. Mm. So uh, I, I work to, you know, with three other guys that um, we all have different specialties, but we all kind of put the final stamp on okay. uh, a product that comes to market. And uh, I work in hard goods okay. in particular. So mm. all of our uh, creepers and uh, cabinets and shelving and uh, the hand tools. Mm -hmm. Like I showed you the, mm -hmm. the USAG tools. That yep. was like my biggest project. And that has allowed me to travel the world and, and source stuff. Um, so cool. It's a really, yeah. it's an awesome job. And again, it, there's, I love coming to work every yeah. day. Like it just, it, it's so much fun. Yep. And so the three, sorry to interrupt you, but the three guys that you talked about in product development, yeah. you talked about your, 
uh, kind of the hard goods guy. Obviously, mm-hmm. you see the chemicals as well. Yeah. But is that those three people, that group, are they in charge of hard goods and liquids and, and all that development? When I say that, I don't mean to uh, say, is it only three people in charge of yeah. products? But, like, is it that tight knit of a group of, like, everything kind of gets passed through this you guys well product development touches and i don't know that there's anybody uh that would say this if, if you sell products uh it is going to touch all your departments at sure. some point right, 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 right um so uh there are there are tons of factors that go into bringing a product to market but in terms of the testing um the ideation mm-hmm. that definitely starts with a core group got it um i spoke to our chemists and what what they do uh, mm. with regards to just the, the varied roles of quality control, sure. formulation, um, compliance, all of those uh, very important things. So we're we're not an enormous company, so we all wear a lot of hats. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the four guys that, that make up product development have a lot of market like knowledge. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of detailing experience. Um, and so, and, and we know who we're working for. Right, right. Right. So we can't, we, we really have to kind of keep ourselves to that standard. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, th- we, we toss a lot around. We buff on a lot of cars. Mm-hmm. I was telling you, we, seems we, awesome. We, you know, we'll, we could go through 40 iterations of a, of a mm-hmm. formula before it does everything we want right. it to do before it smells the right way before, um, you know, it's stable on the shelf. I, I was just, and that was one point I was going to make. It's, we talked about like the different, like how the grilled bottle kind of stands out on the shelf. Right. And it's easy to take that for granted. Right. Like, Oh, it's just a clear bottle and the color is cool. Right. Like the detail spray is blue. It looks really nice and smells great. But it's like the back end of that is like that product could, hopefully it doesn't sit on the shelf at all. Right. Hopefully it sells right away. But the reality (laughs) is it has to get to the store. Right. So like, like the and it has ha- to get to the store in blizzards and right and, you know yeah yeah waves and all those totally of right so the stabilization i guess if that's a word of a product is really a big factor that you have to test right but yeah. it can only be tested with time yeah right you can't make a product sit yeah. like yeah so well in in our laboratory you know we're doing all sorts of we're accelerating uh different timetables we're exposing it to uv we're doing sure. temperature extremes and um so we've got it kind of dialed in um, but yeah, it takes time. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we don't want to put anything out there that isn't right. the very best that, right. that we all feel confident in that meets all the goals sure. that we're trying to do. Hmm. Um, you know, doesn't mean we're perfect. Right. But, sure. Um, but we try to be, but you make it right when, yeah, when exactly, you know, exactly, and I yeah. think that's, a, I think, you know, it, it's kind of like, well, I won't go there. I was going to say, it's kind of like, you know, society as a whole, people, some people have like this doom and gloom outlook, but it's, it's really how you handle it or how you view it. Right. It's like a product could fail. Right. And that, that could be a factor. It could be one bottle of a batch that failed. Right. But it's, yeah. it's not so much. I think people in general are very forgiving. Right. And yeah. and it's really how the company handles it when something bad does happen. Right. It sounds like you guys are more than willing to. Well, and, and that, you know, that again starts with, uh, my dad, mm. he, uh, he will pick up the phone and you know, we, we have a customer service center and yep. we get somebody that is irate. Yep. Guess who we escalate that to? It's Richard. <laughs> and, um, you know, his favorite line is, you know, what is it going to take to make you happy? Yep. What can I do for you? Yep. Do you want your money back to, you know, is there, uh, do I have to ki- kiss your feet? Maybe a little extreme, <laughs> but you know, generally it's right, like, right. you know, somebody depends how much they buy that, you know, if some, <laughs> right. you know, they, and honestly, a lot of times people may have skipped a step sure. for detailing. It's like, who There's reads so the back many variables. of the bottle? No like, one. Yeah. We smell it before we read it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we deal with a lot of that, but really it's, it, we want customers for life and it's mm. super easy to deescalate it by just being genuine. Just right. Like, right. Hey, I, I, I don't feel like I misrepresented that, but you right. had an inferior experience let me make it right. Mm-hmm. And that's powerful. Mm. Um, and again, when it's coming from the top, right. It's yep. everybody understands that. Yep. And, uh, we, we, we definitely, uh, have a tendency to retain people. Yep. It's amazing that the social media aspect, everybody gets a review, right? I mean, people can just blast out sure. a post saying this product sucks. Guess what? Uh, you know, a quick response saying, Hey, would you, you know, would you like a refund? Right. You'll refund it. Right. Right. Uh, uh, my my machine uh, is making a weird noise. Send it back. We'll send you a new one. Yeah. Like that. 
that's pretty that's important. Huge. Um, yep. Especially when somebody depends on that machine mm -hmm. to be reliable for them. I mean, that happens. Electric motors fail. That, that's how it goes, right? Yeah. Just like with cars. Yeah. Stuff fails. Stuff breaks. Yep. And uh, you can make it right. Yep. So then kind of looking forward, right? So we've gone like where it started, where you're at, kind of looking forward. Uh, and part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the show was I knew you did product development, right? I wasn't sure that you're, that it was hard goods, but I figure you see everything that comes through, right? So yeah. product development is super fun for me. So what do you, without saying too much, yeah. and I know your dad alluded to some <laughs> things that I won't repeat because yeah. I don't know how I know. public he, you want he that. He the beans. He was the first person to tell everybody in the building that my wife was pregnant. <laughs> it's like, that's my news, dude. You're like, dad, shut up. Yeah. Would you? But uh, so you don't have to go there if you don't want to, but uh, what are what are kind of some things that Griots is maybe not even looking at, but what do you see Griots kind of doing in the future is it going globally is it w what is it yeah well um yeah i i definitely think that we have international aspirations for sure um that that'll definitely be something that's part of our future mm -hmm. i think we are uh, a patient company mm. so we're going to do things on our own schedule and gotcha. uh, and when we are ready and uh, one question we get a ton is about ceramic products. I, I was just going to say, it, and that makes sense that you're a patient company, though, yeah. because I was going to say you guys haven't really entered into the ceramic realm at all. Yeah, and, and that really comes down to the, uh, the manufacturing aspect. Got it. Um, we want to uh, be able to make it ourselves. Mm. And that is a very specific product with very specific equipment needed for it. Interesting. And right now we're looking at a marketplace that is flush with options. Right, right. I mean, it, like SEMA last year, there's 10 more coding companies right. that uh, weren't there the year before. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, how'd you get here? Like, or, mm -hmm. uh, And they're right. saying like they've been in business for X amount of years. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, gosh, I don't know. Right. Um, so and, and that's not to disparage. There's some really great products out there, but we want to we want to be in control of that. Right. Just like we are with the, our other liquids. So um, we're working on that. And uh, I think once we are ready to bring something to market, it's going to be very exceptional. Um, think it'll be by SEMA this year? I, I, I can't make any promises, okay. uh, but it's on our radar. Got it. And, and we are actively working on it. Um, and then just as with anything else, um, we have, we have uh, some special chemicals. We have some special tools <laughs> um, that, that we're working on developing. And, and you know, we – uh, the mantra that guides us is uh, strive for perfection and everything. Yeah. Um, very evident, by the yeah. way, that that's a great mantra. Yeah. Take I, I, it's very, it's a very evident mantra, I should say. Yeah. And, and take the best that exists and make it better is another aspect of that quote. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we're in a position where we have a lot of equity and a lot of credibility mm. in, in a lot of our product lines, but that doesn't mean that we're complacent. Right. And yeah. Um, so we're, we're going to be, uh, like like Richard said, th this will be an exciting year for us. For yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, we've got some we got some fun stuff coming out. All right, I'm calling it. Griots is gonna release a ceramic at SEMA. <laughs> <All right, laughs> Just kidding. Right, and time, time that's based on no information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I won't I won't give you that certainty, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, I mean that's th that uh, product type has really taken a hold. And and from mm. your background, I mean, I think the most important contribution is that has made professional detailing. A very lucrative job extremely lucrative and yeah. it, it's kind of an interesting dynamic coming in with the like the uh, the consumer versions of quote-unquote ceramics yeah. right and it, it time will tell what that does to that very lucrative uh professional market yeah. right because now we have this the marketing spin on everything right which i don't fault any of the brands for doing it right because yeah. they're trying to move i have two two opinions on that one i think it's actually going to help the professional right because it's bringing those terms like sio2 and ceramic to the consumer market similar to like the clay bar yeah right yeah no consumer really knows what the clay bar does <laughs> <laughs> maybe not none but a lot of them think it removes scratches yeah right but they know they need it or want it or there's something about the clay bar that consumers want right they can go down to any auto parts store and clay bar, they could buy a clay bar kit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I get a lot of customers that call me wanting a clay bar service. Right. So it helps both. So 
with the with the it raises everybody's level of education right? exactly yeah. and awareness right yeah. so i think there's one aspect of that i think one uh, the other aspect that i'm not really concerned about is that is that uh professionals are going to lose out on it i think we all know that a professional level of something is, is vastly different than than a consumer aspect of it though that gap is tightening yeah i feel like there's still well, there's, look, still there's nobody for that's going to go out and perfect the paint like somebody with experience and, and time to do right. that, uh, let alone just the quality of abrasives and right. skill that it takes to get a paint finish for, for an actual you know 9H yeah, ceramic right. coating. Uh, these sprayable things, they do offer a benefit and they 100%. offer some ease, but they're also going to have some side effects like because – Yep. You're dealing with a harder material that's going to yep. create some highs and lows. And well, that's the, that's, and that is the question, though. Do they actually harden? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah, I mean, <laughs> trust me, the, the nice thing about having a chemistry lab <laughs> right. in, in our facility, we can cut through some marketing right. jargon pretty damn quick. Totally. Uh, you know, when, right. when somebody states, you know, 5% of dissolved sure. solids, like that's yeah. a pretty simple reading that we can right, take right, and, right. and call BS on that. Um, so it, it's, uh, again, and also I, ensure that when you release a product that the consumer confidence can be high, knowing that you probably have thought about all those claims. Yes. Right. And again, I think just for us, uh, at this point in, in our business and maturity, we, uh, we acknowledge the market trend. Sure. Um, but we also have to be certain sure. about our place in it. Yep. And, and that is really done by us manufacturing it. Um, and having complete control of that formulation. Yep. So yep. Uh, with time, we'll, we will get there. But um, in the meantime, we just have we have so much you know, in front of us yeah. that it's, it's a really exciting time. Is there anything I missed that you want to make sure you get across or you want to say? Or is there anything about Griot's brand, the garage, what you got coming up, yourself? No, no. like, I mean, again, we're looking at uh, some private label beer opportunities <laughs> and bunch of other stuff on my desk which is a huge mess but and the pacific northwest is i learned this from being here for like the past day and a half like the mecca for beer oh man we've got some we're pretty or spoiled hops? we're pretty spoiled okay. up here oh for for hop production yes hop production on okay. the east side of the state uh the yakima valley that is like some of the best environment in the world for growing hops interesting so okay we'll have german beer brands buying yakima valley hops oh, wow. okay um but yeah i, I mean again in Tacoma proper, which is about like a three and a half mile radius, there's 18 microbreweries. Wow. Um, and uh, one of my best buddies, the guy who I used to detail with, okay, he's actually uh, a brewmaster at one of oh, them. Oh, wow. Very and, cool. And we, we do cook up some pretty good beer in the garage as well, which <laughs> is like, uh, yeah, it all goes hand in hand. Hey, have fun in your garage, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool man well i appreciate you taking the time to i know you got a baby a family <laughs> and a million other things to do so i appreciate you taking the time to give me the tour and sit down to do this so and yeah, i know man. everyone else will appreciate your story as well it's been a pleasure man and again you're more than welcome to come back and maybe after some of these uh product launches yeah. hit we'll uh, <laughs> we'll have more to talk about sounds good man okay Jimbo. all right